keynote session. Professor Butt is a chairman Indian Philosophy Congress and former chairman Indian Council of Philosophical Research. Welcome Professor to the dais. I also take a privilege to invite Sri Ram Madhavji, National General Secretary, Bharti Janta Party and member Board of Governors, India Foundation. Welcome sir to the dais. May I invite Honorable Honorable Mano Ganesan, Minister of National Integration, Official Languages, Social Progress and Hindu Religious Affairs, Government of Sri Lanka. With a great privilege, I invite Sri Hari Prasad Swamiji. Swamiji is a managing trustee, Sri Vishnu Mohan Foundation, India. May I invite uh, Venerable Professor Teach. Satno Tu, Deputy Rector, Vietnam Buddhist University, Vietnam, and founding member, International Buddhist Confederation in Vietnam. I now request Honorable Chair to take over the keynote session. Distinguished keynote speakers on the dais, honorable delegates from different parts of the world, revered monks, and dear friends. We are here to deliberate on a theme which is of a great significance. A human being who claims to be rational and rationative. Human life is a prized possession and therefore has tremendous uh, responsibility being the highest evolute in the cosmic process. Human being therefore has to know what is uh, his or her own self the surroundings is also the meaning and purpose of uh, our existence. Our ancestors have told us that human being has tremendous potentiality for self ennoblement self enhancement and for that what is required is the knowledge of reality true knowledge of reality to know things as they are not different from what they are and then to make best use of the existence of one's own and of the surroundings for betterment of uh, one's own self. And this betterment consists in realization of uh, peace, perfection, and beatitude. Therefore, we thought that uh, 
we should deliberate on this particular theme from uh, both the Vedic and the Buddhist uh, traditions and uh, also we bring in the Jain tradition which are the three components of uh, Indian culture. We take dharma in a very wide sense, not in the sense of any sectarian approach to reality. Dharma vishwasya jagata pratishtha. And or when Buddha said, dhammam sharanam gachami, well, he didn't mean uh, any particular cult, whether it be Hindu cult or uh, Jaina cult or Buddhist cult or Islamic cult or uh, Christian cult and so forth. Dharma has been regarded as a sustaining principle. Dharana dharmityahu dharmena dharate prajaha. It is the regulating principle of life. Jodhna lakshana ortho dharma. And it is the ennobling, ennobling both in the physical, mental, and uh, spiritual dimensions. Yato abhyudaya nishya siddhi sa dharma. So we take dharma or dhamma in a very wide sense. Dharma stands for those uh, guiding principles which uh, make uh, human life uh, truly human. And therefore, dharmic principles stand for uh, universal friendship, universal compassion, universal wellness, and uh, mutual caring and uh, sharing. It has been insisted in our tradition, both uh, the Vedic, the Jain, and the Buddhist, that uh, we have dependent origination and interdependent existence. We don't live the life of a Ruby Robinson Crusoe. We have to, and this interdependence is universal, as has been uh, now ratified by the quantum physics. And therefore, there has to be peaceful coexistence, mutual cooperation, and reciprocal caring and sharing. Well, this is the ideal that uh, a human being has to put forth. And if we have that uh, ideal to uh, pursue, then definitely there will be peace and uh, plenitude in the world. All is not well in the present day existential scenario. In the inaugural speech itself, uh, this has been pointed out. We find that uh, there are uh, stresses in human life, there are turmoils in the outer world, there are struggles and conflicts among the human beings and nations. Well, terrorism is also there as a great menace we are facing and therefore it is high time that uh, we revisit those noble ideas and ideals which have been posited in the cultural traditions of uh, these, uh, I should say, different uh, facets of uh, Indian wisdom. Indian wisdom is holistic. It takes into account the entire uh, cosmos and therefore it talks of wellness, not of an individual or a community, but the whole universal. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, this has been our ideal. <coughs> I don't want to speak much. We have uh, several uh, very distinguished uh, panelists. We have uh, Sri Ram Madhavji, who is uh, a profound thinker, a prolific writer, and uh, a visionary as well. This. Uh, Conference is, in fact, uh, his uh, brainchild, and uh, we shall be listening to his uh, learned discourse. We have uh, 
a few other uh, important speakers. We have Swami uh, Hari Prakash Ji from Chennai. We have uh, Professor uh, Thich Nhat Thu from uh, Vietnam. Only a few months back, he organized the United Nations uh, Visakha celebration in which uh, we had more than 4,000 participants. I think how many? More 4,000? 50,000 <laughs> were there. <coughs> and uh, I was one of the, the keynote speakers there. Uh, and we uh, saw the procession of the monks, 50,000 monks assembled there in Hanoi. So, and uh, he's also a very prolific writer. We have uh, other uh, speakers with us from uh, different countries. So, I now invite uh, Sri Ram Madhavji to enlighten us uh, with his uh, views. Thank you, Professor Bhatsab. The journey should always be from non-scholars to scholars. So beginning with a non-scholar. <laughs> Thank you and uh, pronounce to all my fellow uh, panelists and uh, all the eminent scholars present in, uh, here in the fifth uh, uh, international conference on Dharma and Dhamma. Since it uh, is supposed to be a keynote, I will be completely non-political. <laughs> Alexander was on his way to conquering the world. <laughs> when he bumped into Diogenes, a naked monk resting nonchalantly by the side of a beach, the soldiers wake him up, asking him to give way to the to Alexander. They describe Alexander as, the Ale as Alexander the Great. Diogenes laughs out loud. Alexander was taken aback. Then Diogenes says, I, am, uh, I haven't seen a more foolish person than one who calls himself the Great. A philosophical discourse ensues. Alexander was convinced and uh, decides to follow Diogenes, but seeks some time to return because he had a mission to conquer the world. He says, I will come back to you, become your disciple after completing my mission. Diogenes says that if you want to come, come now because there is no afterwards in this. Alexander greets him and asks him if he can do anything to that monk. Diogenes says, please get out of my way. I am enjoying my sunbath. What Alexander had with Diogenes was a philosophical discourse. Philosophy, philo is love, sophy is knowledge. It's a discourse on knowledge. What Diogenes wanted to convey was philo, sophia. Philo is love. Sophia, the Latin word, means tasting, experiencing. What is needed? What was needed according to Diogenes was love for seeking and experiencing, not just mere love for knowledge. That experience is what Satchidananda means. As many speakers have already highlighted, Sat is existence, Chit is consciousness, and Ananda is eternal bliss. Parama Ananda. Rishi Arvindo and many scholars have highlighted the fact 
that at a superior plane, these are not three, but they are together as one. Existence is consciousness, and consciousness is bliss. They are inseparable and indistinct from each other. They are one. And as Pooja Swamiji has mentioned in his speech, they are the one, the omnipresent, the omnipotent, the divine, the God consciousness. Now the life's goal is to reach there. And reaching there is a journey inwards. In the Eastern philosophies, it is well known to everybody that humans have body, intellect, mind, and soul. Man is a physical being, a vital being, a mental being, and a spiritual being. There is a very important distinction. Three out of these four, there is dualism in them. At the physical level, you experience pain and pleasure, the opposites, health and disease. At the buddhi level, at the vital level, you feel happiness as well as sadness. Going to the third stage, at mental level, you have emotions like love and hatred. There is dualism. But beyond that, at the soul level, there is no dualism. Soul is non-dual. There are no opposites in spiritual experience. To put it conversely, realizing non-duality is spiritualism. The ultimate happiness lies in that. And some describe it as eternal bliss, Paramananda, and some call it moksha. There is a stage called soul happiness in our inward journey that we encounter. Jiddu Krishnamurti ji's famous saying is there that it is in giving, not in taking, the eternal bliss is there. A mother is happy when her child is well fed even if she goes hungry. A father is happy when her, his son is well educated even if he ends up in debts. This is happiness of the soul. But here, there is a bandhana, a bond that influences this happiness. My son, my daughter, that bandhana influences this holy soul happiness. So in that sense, it is time and space limited. But moksha, the eternal happiness, parama ananda, it occurs only when you rise above the bonds, above these bandhanas. I would like to highlight a very interesting dimension here. In at least the Hindu civilizational experience, this Paramananda, this Mokshatva happened to those people who did not desire for it, rather rejected it. Natvaham kamaye rajyam, nasvargam nacha punar bhavam, kamaye dukkha taptanam, Pranina Martinashanam, this was Raja Rantidev. I do not de desire the kingdom. I am not desirous of uh, uh, heaven. 
ఐ డూ నాట్ వాంట్ బర్త్ లెస్నెస్ అపునర్భవం ఐ జస్ట్ వాంట్ టు ఐఎమ్ ఓన్లీ డిజైరస్ ఆఫ్ మిటిగేటింగ్ ది సారోస్ ఆఫ్ ద లివింగ్ and it is said that ranti deva attained moksha swami vivekananda in one of his uh, famous statements says that i want to be born again and again on this holy land until i am able to mitigate the hunger of the last dog not even the last man the last dog but there is no proof that swami vivekananda was reborn he attained mokshatva this also gives a message that when we say we have to rise above desires desiring moksha is also a desire eternal bliss is possible when one overcomes all desires including the desire for eternal bliss because all desires originate at the mind level you know it is said that light travels at the speed of 168000 miles per second and desires travel faster than that and desires are the most mischievous things in our life and mind is where all these desires originate in fact uh, one uh, uh israeli diplomat has once uh, on a lighter note commented that men and nations behave wisely only after they have exhausted all other alternatives because you have mind sachidananda the moksha is not there to desire or gain it is there to be experienced this experience no doubt begins from the physical world in which we live that's why we said in our country isa vasya midam sarvam has to be the starting point of this realization that god is everywhere everything that you see or you do not see is ishvara is god that is the starting point but man has to travel from there to realization of the of the omnipresent to uh, i mean to realization of the omnipresent in the physical world to a state where he becomes the omnipresent himself that is the journey in upanishads we called it aham brahmasmi i am the creator i am the brahma i am the god so it is a journey from being to becoming becoming is moksha upanishad called that becoming as sachidananda since we are talking about nirvana buddha's trajectory was slightly different buddha described bliss as ending of sorrow where there is no sorrow that is bliss not just overcoming desires but ending sorrow dukha nirodha is bliss according to buddha hence buddha talked about nirvana not about moksha the hindu scholars will forgive me for saying this but in moksha i exist i have to get moksha i have to be mukta of bonds i have to be free of bondage there is i in it buddha simple question was where there is i where is moksha how is moksha possible but nirvana is where you are just not there like a candle that is extinguished buddha used the word sunyata for it there is a 
ನಿಯರ್ ಈಕ್ವಿಲೆಂಟ್ ಉಪನಿಷದಿ ಕಾನ್ಸೆಪ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೂರ್ಣತ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಪ್ರಾಬಬ್ಲಿ ಎ ಕಿಂಟ್ ಟು ಶೂನ್ಯತ ಇನ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಿ ಸೇ ಪೂರ್ಣ ಮದ ಪೂರ್ಣ ಮಿದಂ ಪೂರ್ಣಾತ್ ಪೂರ್ಣ ಮುದಚ್ಚತೆ ಪೂರ್ಣತ ದಿ ಹೋಲ್ನೆಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ಡಿವಿಸಬಲ್ ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ತ ಪೂರ್ಣ ಮಾದ ಯು ಆಡ್ ಪೂರ್ಣತ ಟು ಪೂರ್ಣತ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಪೂರ್ಣತ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸಿಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ನಾನ್ ಎಕ್ಸಿಸ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಮ್ಯಾನಿಫೆಸ್ಟ್ ಅನ್ಮ್ಯಾನಿಫೆಸ್ಟ್ನೆಸ್ we talked about that purnata this is the inward journey that we need to undertake it is obviously tedious adi shankara in his uh, discourses talks about the world being maya jagan mithya it's the whole world is illusionary mythical is there any physical state called maya is world not there it is there it is real but this illusion is in our minds maya is in our minds man's journey is through the physical world he has to reach purnata but the illusions that he has to overcome are the illusions of his mind that is where all philosophies all ideologies and all practices and experiments operate hindus have mastered this science of being in the physical world while journeying towards the inner world they called it dharma dharma is a set of rules that guide the human mind in this world and hereafter yato obhyudaya nishreya sa siddhi happiness in this world uh, sorry progress in this world and happiness in the after world dharma is nothing but a natural order what is just natural what is just spontaneous is dharma in fact that is exactly what we should teach people spontaneity in life life has to be lived spontaneously when lord krishna preached bhagavad gita to arjuna did he make a three month preparation for that which you do in your classrooms it was spontaneous there was arjuna with certain illusions there was arjuna with certain uh, certain distress and there krishna in his spontaneous form existence is spontaneous you have to exist spontaneously rejecting the existence in search of sachidananda no existence is sat we should be deeply grateful for this existence not rejection of it just love it and just live it but exist not for anything not for any belief nor even for any ideology just exist and enjoy vivekananda in one of his speeches Uh, in uh, world parliament of religions he talks about a conversation king yudhishthir had his with wife uh, wife raises questions over uh, why we are facing so much so many problems and miseries yudhishthir says this is the quote behold my queen the himalayas the grand and beautiful they are how grand and beautiful they are i just love them they do not do me anything but my nature is to love the grand the beautiful therefore i love them similarly i love the lord he is the source of all beauty of all sublimity he is the only object to be loved my nature is to love him and therefore i love i do not pray for anything i do not ask for anything let him place me wherever he likes i must love him for the sake of love i cannot trade in love this was yudhishthira this is the basis of sachidananda in hindu philosophy 
where the experiencer gains ananda without any conditions, without any quid pro quo. Now for that realization, I just make one more slightly provocative argument here to conclude my presentation. For that realization, two ways are prescribed by two great religions. Ek sadhana, ek dhyana. Common word for these two is meditation. Many a times, we mistake meditation to concentration. For 20 minutes, you concentrate, concentrate on a word or on an image. Concentration means conflict with your mind, remember. Your mind is running here and there. You want to catch hold of it and want to put it through this rigor of concentration. It's actually you are conflicting with your mind. I would say meditation should be not about concentration, but about relaxation of the mind. Let mind be relaxed. If you find relaxation in running, that is your meditation. If you find relaxation in crying, that is your meditation. If you find relaxation is laughing, that is your meditation. These ways that we prescribe for this inward journey need to be non-conflicting. Friends, at the end of it, the only question that matters in realizing Sachidananda is whether you experience your inner real you. That is Sachidananda or Nirvana. Thank you. Thank you, Sri Ram Madhavji, for a, a very profound philosophical delineation on the theme. You have rightly pointed out that uh, a philosophical reflection is uh, a love for wisdom, but I would like to go a step further. It's also a love for a life lived in wisdom. And therefore, a philosophical deliberation should not only have a, a strong theoretical foundation, but also a practi viable, practical mode of uh, living. Indian philosophy is uh, therefore uh, at once both a symbiosis of uh, theory and uh, praxis, vichara and uh, achara. You have also rightly pointed out that uh, sat, chit, and ananda are uh, equal in their connotation. Every existence has a, a built-in capacity of awareness, self-awareness. And that self-awareness would uh, ultimately, if it is genuine one, lead to ananda or bliss. Bliss, therefore, is uh, the summum bonum of all existence. You have also rightly pointed out a distinction between mundane pleasure and uh, spiritual bliss. We generally indulge in mundane pleasures, but seldom seek uh, the eternal bliss. Mundane pleasures are transitory, and ultimately they are uh, misery mongering and result in uh, unhappiness. So it's a sort of a contradiction that we seek happiness, but uh, we lend in unhappiness. But in case of eternal bliss, well, uh, it is uh, something which uh, does not uh, come to an end. It is, uh, we use the word 
चिरंतन एंड शाश्वत एवर लास्टिंग यू ऑल्सो राइटली पॉइंटेड आउट दैट देर हैज टू बी फंडामेंटल यूनिटी ऑफ ऑल एग्जिस्टेंसेस डिफरेंसेस आर देयर बट दे आर ओनली एट द इम्पीरिकल लेवल एट द ट्रांसेंडेंटल लेवल ऑल आर वन एंड दिस इज द मेसेज ऑफ द उपेस्टिक स्टेटमेंट तत् तम असी आर अहम ब्रह्मास्मी एक्सेट्रा ए पर्सन who has realized this fundamental oneness of all existences will always have universal friendship universal compassion and would always act for a universal wellness sarva bhuta hit this is the message of the bhagavad gita in fact uh, for this what is needed is both individual effort as well as collective enterprise when we talk of moksha no doubt it is individual moksha of an individual but there cannot be moksha of an individual without there being collaborative uh, support from the others so always uh, moksha has to be collective it can't be single it can't be partite it has to be impartite and only that sort of moksha should uh, lead to ultimate uh, happiness or uh, bliss in fact uh, in the present uh, worldly scenario we are more often in our uh, academic and intellectual and uh, practical uh, uh, mode of living guided by desires and uh, desires always uh, lead to those there might be temporary fulfillment but they lead to misery only ultimately so desire lessness should be the ultimate uh, state of uh, existence but it doesn't mean that we should uh, refrain from activity in the bhagavad gita we have a, a very beautiful analysis of uh, samnyasa well uh, you have to act uh, but without being attached to the consequences of the action let the consequences be renounced for the totality so there has to be a sort of universalization of i into we instead of i being the agent we are the agent and therefore we have to distributively utilize the fruits of our activities so this theme asti bhati and priya sat chit and ananda is something which is uh, a message of uh, indian culture which is to be emulated world over and if it is sincerely understood and practiced definitely there will be world peace world prosperity and happiness all around now i invite uh, venerable sorry uh, swami sri hari prasad ji to make his uh, presentation swami hari prasad ji please narayana 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 professor but told me the theme was sachit ananda so then i said such a vast subject what can i say about so then he said you talk about sat so i told him that i would talk about sat but i would talk in my own way about how because <clears throat> i am a 
डिसाइपल ऑफ श्री सदगुरु स्वामी ज्ञानानंद सरस्वती हु से दैट ट्रांस फिलोसफी एंड नॉलेज ऑफ द शास्त्र शुड ट्रांसफॉर्म यू अदरवाइज इट वाज नो यूज एंड दैट इज समथिंग व्हिच आई हैव बीन गोइंग ऑल ओवर टीचिंग पीपल सो इट विल बी माय एक्सपीरियंस अबाउट सत इज सो normally when we think of sat we think of the most famous expression about sat ekam sat pipra bahuda badanti and i always say that if it wasn't for that statement and the statement of shri bhagwan in the gita that ye yatham prapadyante in which ever way men seek me in that way i fulfill them there india would not be in a such a special country welcoming all religions welcoming all ideas of thought but then sat is also reality so professor ji had just mentioned now about the connection between acharam and vicharam the thought and actions the thought and behavior the thought and of which we are connected to and what we are doing my guru also used to tell us you can't pray to krishna in the morning and go outside and behave like kamsa so we must really connect with sat with the reality if we are going to really experience it Sri Ram Madhav Ji mentioned uh, the King Ranti Deva. His experience of kingship, of the duties of being a king, was absolutely connected with his experience of reality around, of the oneness of all beings. Also, so he was both as a follower of the eternal Dharma. connected with everybody and as a king because of his <coughs> dharma he was connected with everybody so that is why he was willing to sacrifice all he had for the praja so with that uh, the ideals which have been given to us we must see what we are doing what is our connection with the world outside with the reality outside before we can go and see the seek the reality inside because to see that the whole world is the same parabrahmam we must be able to look at the whole world connect with it and feel all it is feeling just like we feel for ourselves आत्मपम्येन सर्वत्र समं पश्यति योर्जुन सुखम वा यदि आ दुखम स योगी परमो मत सो दैट योगी इज द ग्रेटेस्ट हू हैज द सेम फीलिंग ऑफ हैप्पीनेस एंड सोरो सो वेन आई वॉज ए यंग ब्रह्मचारी आई रेड इट आई थॉट दैट ओ दिस मीन्स दैट यू शुड हैव वन स्टैंडर्ड for the whole world that we are going to uh, if it's uh, doing something to hurt somebody there we should uh, also apply the same standard to ourselves we object to something being done to us we should object to it being done to somebody else but uh, as i progressed on the spiritual path and as i observed i found that the greatest saints the greatest knowers of brahman they actually felt the other person sorrow they felt the same thing for all beings and when somebody else did have unhappiness they were also unhappy that did not stop them from doing their dharma but they had that empathy when shri krishna went to mathura he did not have any hesitation in destroying kamsa and his totalitarian rule but when he saw 
the wives of Kamsa, Asti and Prapti, crying by the body. He felt so sorry for them. He felt their sorrow and he cried too. So, this is what it is. You connect with Sat, with what's outside. Outside, there is a, the whole world is suffering for water. There are places where water is coming down more and more. The shortage of water is becoming greater and greater. But if I'm going to not think about that, if I'm just going to say that, here where I'm staying, there's enough water for me, I'm going to open the tap wide. I'm going to sit and meditate on Parabrahmam afterwards. I'm not connecting with Parabrahmam. I'm just a hypocrite, that's all. That's all, I'm just a hypocrite. We have to see that our actions are in connection with reality. We have to, this, so this brings a lot of, a lot of a activity, a lot of thought, a lot of uh, self-transformation in its progress. The idea that we have to conform to reality. We have to see what is happening outside. We have to also see what we are. We have to look at ourselves. If I'm saying that we should be careful with water, to everybody and I'm not careful with water. If I'm telling everybody that twice a day you must meditate, otherwise you're going to really get lost in the rat race of the world, I must also be doing that. Because I believe in it and that's why I'm saying it. So it must be rea real to me before I tell anybody else. So that is something which is very unfortunate that in this world, that the religious leaders of today, irrespective of religion, are not really anchoring themselves sufficiently in the teachings to which they are theirs, which they has been given to them to transmit to the next generation and further. How do they trans how does are they expected to transmit it? In two ways. One is by making it sat, by making it part of their lives, by showing which is the way they should be living. And the other is by boldly teaching it. One Swami, I remember as a boy, I heard him saying, if I talk about general uh, uh, Vedanta, people are listening. But if I talk about self-control, then people in the back rows, they start getting up and going off. It's true. But if I have seen my guru who practiced self-control to the maximum, talk about self-control and people staying and listening. So you've got to be firm in what you're doing and not count the cost. If it means that when I go to a college and ask young people to avoid tobacco and alcohol, and they, when I went to one place and spoke, the children, many of the young people were openly making fun. Many of them were, uh, you know, showing their disinterest very obviously until then went towards a question of concentration, meditation, and how that can change your life. They, everyone wanted to hear. When I spoke about how bad tobacco and alcohol can be, nobody wanted to hear. Because those who are already uh, convinced, they, they felt, I mean, what's used to saying, we already know it. And those who were not, they did not want to be convinced also. But I would not be a true disciple of my guru, if I did not continue saying it. So I say it. Wherever I go, I do say it. People don't like it, but I do say it. So, to by grace of God, I'm able to live to an extent in Sat at least. So we have to see the whole thing rests upon self-awareness. We have to keep watching ourselves. Are we following Sat? What are we doing when I'm 
saying something to somebody is it something which I believe in. I may not be practicing so much because I am on the path, I can say that. But I cannot be saying I am not trying to practice it. That's wrong. So, self-awareness, looking at ourselves, the way we look at other people. Sadhguru used to say, my guru used to say, keep that inner policeman active all the time checking on yourself. So if I don't do that, then my connection with Sat is lost. So this experience of Sat, when we do this, we will find things happening in our lives which are very remarkable when we start connecting like this. And we'll find a sort of coherence and a sort of comfort in our lives. So this is something which is worth trying to do, connecting ourselves, our lives with Sat. Now I know that there are so many, many ways of interpreting Sat, of talking about Sat. But this is something which is the aspect of Sat in a dynamic form. So you see Satyam eva jayate nandritam. This is not talking about just plain existent Brahman. This is Brahman, which is active, which is dynamic. Satyena pantahi vitato devayana. The way which of Sat is what the devas follow. Why are they shining? Because they are following Satyam. When they stop following Satyam, then the asuras come and throw them out and they go and hide. So the Devayana is the dynamic form of Satya. Satya, when it, we interact with it, it interacts with us, it protects us, it takes us on, even though it looks as though it takes us into difficulty. So this power of satya is the shakti form. Then we have the jnana form of how it is. There are so many ways in which we can connect with it. With how the great saints have given up their lives on numerous occasions for their beliefs because of that satya being present and they approached it through bhakti. So, but this is like I told you, Professor Ji, my idea about Sat, how it can be used and lived with. I hope I have not disappointed you. Thank you. Thank you, Swamiji, for pointing out the needed symbiosis of uh, theory and uh, praxis. We may know the reality, but not act uh, in accordance with that because our knowledge is merely information, not wisdom. So a clear distinction has to be drawn between descriptive awareness of the reality and its uh, prescriptive uh, injective nature. We must act uh, in accordance with knowledge that we acquire. We have a very popular saying in Sanskrit, janami dharmam nachame pravritti, janami adharmam nachame nivritti. But that uh, person who claims to know, in fact, really doesn't know. He merely has an information. That information is not transformative. It must, it must tell upon one's uh, mode of living. So, we say in our tradition that uh, mansa vacha karmana means uh, there has to be perfect uh, coordination between thought, speech, speech and uh, action. And if that is done, then that is an ideal life. Well, we may teach values 
to our own self or to our pupils. But your verses don't follow, don't practice them. And then I think it's a futile exercise. So what is needed uh, is therefore uh, to know the sata with the chitta. To know the real with a, a ratio in it, your uh, intellect. Lord Buddha insisted on the symbiosis of uh, pragya and karuna. Pragya without karuna is lame and karuna without pragya is uh, blind, so to say. S and therefore, uh, Swamiji, you have very rightly pointed out the need for uh, a perfect coordination between uh, what we know and what we do or practice. If you have a really a kushala chitta to follow a Buddhist uh, physiology, then uh, there must be a kushal charya. Kushala chitta should result in kushal charya, and a bodhisattva is one in whom we have a kushala chitta as well as a kushal charya. And uh, there are two marks of a bodhisattva in Bodhi Charya Avatar of Shantideva, Paratma Samata and Paratma Parivartan. Not only we should feel one with the others, but we should transform ours with others. So if others are unhappy, we should also be unhappy and not only be unhappy, try to remove the unhappiness of uh, others. So it is the practical nature of knowledge which is being emphasized. So we are grateful to you for this uh, enlightenment. Now I request a venerable Professor Dr. Uh, Thich Nhat Thu, Vice Rector of uh, Vietnam Buddhist uh, Academy and University to make his uh, delegation. Professor Thich Nhat Thu. Very good uh, afternoon and namaste. Most valuable monks from uh, Buddhist tradition and Hindu traditions. Your Excellencies, Your Eminence, Professor Sunaina Singh, Vice Chancellor of uh, Nalanda University, and Professor Path, Chairman in the Philosophy Congress. It is my right honor to be here in the land of Nalanda, where the um, Nalanda University was founded in um, the fifth century as a gift of knowledge to um, uh, humanity and as well as, as a giver of the wisdom for the Gopo citizen in the ancient time. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank in the foundation as well as uh, Nalanda University in me. Um, for serving you in this uh, important gathering. I would like to focus my sharing on the two core issues. Number one, the Ananda of Nirvana. And number two, the uh, Chit, consciousness and cognizance in Nirvana. According to uh, Buddhist tradition, especially Theravada Buddhism. Nirvana, or the noble truth, or the utter state of cessation of suffering, is the suffering goal of Buddhist spiritual uh, part in this very life. Nirvana is the highest stage of happiness and bliss in complete absence of human suffering out of freedom from suffering. The realization of uh, Nibbana is therefore defined as a total elimination of unsatisfactoriness. Psychologically, Nibbana is a free state of mind, the state of highest freedom and perfection, the highest happiness attained to wisdom and moral perfection. Nibbana is not a state of death, nor not assistant, nor annihilation, nor heavenly sphere. 
It also should not be understood in terms of transcendentalism with reference to Brahman of Upanishad or God of the theistic religions according to Buddhism. Nibbana is not the origin of the universe. Therefore, the attainment of Nibbana is not to unite with that origin of universe. Nibbana is simply the stage of tirelessly ending of suffering. Nibbana is also defined as the beautiful state of mind, such as freedom from sorrow, security, a state of stability, peacefulness without any fear from any quarter, perfect peace, the unshakable, the immovable beauty, and perfect health. As a perfect state of transformation, Nirvana is defined as freedom, liberation, supreme security from bondage, the destruction of mental cankers, the complete extinction of defilements, the destruction of unwholesome motivation, cessation of becoming, and freedom from attachment. The most debated, misunderstood, and misinterpreted aspect of Nirvana is the after death position of the enlightened, according to Buddhism. As regards this state of Nirvana after death, the passage of uh, Iti Vuttaka 38 would be the standard reference. I quote, What is Nibbana without reminder? Here, a man is an arahat who has destroyed all mental cankers, left the holy life, done what was to be done, laid out the burden, attained the goal, extinguished the factor of becoming free from the right wisdom. In him, in this very life, our sensations no longer rejoice in have become cool. That is what is called Nirvana without reminder. According to this passage, the death enlightened is subject to no further becoming for all of his feelings and same experiences are totally cooled. This arises where with the Samyutta Nikaya, where it is stated that he knows that at the dissolution of the body at that, on that he experiences, and on that lack liver for him we become cool, and the body will be left over. Here, due to the coolness of all sensual experiences, the death enlightened is really free from dukkha in its three forms, namely suffering caused by physical pain, suffering caused by diverse change of things, and suffering caused by psychological change. In the discussion of Nirvana, at the cessation of samsara, the conclusion arrived in Buddhism is that the enlightened person is subject no more birth in the future due to his complete destruction of craving, grasping, and ignorance. Regarding the jit or cognition in um, uh, Nirvana, it is uh, believed that the realization of Nirvana is defined as a total ending of suffering. An important question is asked as to what can thought and feeling produced by such can thought the enlightened person has with his environment are. After enlightenment, the Buddha cannot escape from contact with the external world. As a logical, logical result of that contact, and because of their sense faculties, remain unimpaired. The difference between the enlightenment and the ordinary person in the process of contact is not quantitative, but of qualitative, or the way they view and react to it. The contact and feeling 
which the Latin person accomplishes with his environment is different from that of the ordinary person. For his mind is master, and his same faculty is controlled by exercise of uh, wise reflections. For the enlightenment, feeling is seen as a mere feeling without any emotional judgment and reaction arising therein. He has full understanding of the nature of feeling. He knows the phenomena of feelings and the rising of feeling. Cognition transformation is one of the attributes of the enlightened who attain nibbana in this very life. All the emotional and cognitive unwholesomeness, such as risk and lust, hatred, ignorance are totally destroyed. This knowledge in nibbana is also defined at the time of higher knowledge, a vision born from that unheard of before. Due to the time limit, I would like to conclude my discussion here. And before conclusion, I would like to take this opportunity to seek the support from the Indy Foundation as well as from Nala University to support National Vietnam Buddhist Sangha to be the host of the Sit Dhamma, Dhamma Conference in Vietnam, maybe in um, 2020. I would like to print your notice that National Vietnam Buddhist Sangha is an umbrella, um, umbrella Sangha having um, 19,000 temples and um, 60,000 monastic members in the whole country. And we has uh, organized the United Nations Adventure for three times. The first time was in 2008 in Hanoi. We invited um, um, 1,300 scholars from uh, uh, 55 countries attending. The second time was in um, 1914. We invited uh, 89 countries and um, 1,400 international participants. Last May, for the third time, we invited 1,670 uh, international participants from 130 countries around the world. And Professor Bart was a keynote speaker of uh, our vessel's version last time. We are lucky to have the support of our government Especially, we also have the support from uh, His uh, Excellency um, uh, Farm Sancho, who sits in the first row. So please uh, stand up and uh, give him a big hand. <laughs> Due to his support, we could invite Vice uh, President of India, uh, Prime Minister of uh, Nepal, as well as the Chairman of the uh, National Assembly of uh, Bhutan, and uh, Deputy. General Secretary of UN attending the Vesak celebration in Vietnam. So I guarantee and ensure that if your support uh, of uh, Vietnam to be the host uh, of um, Dhamma, Dhamma Conference in Vietnam, that conference will be a great success. Thank you for your, uh, your listening and your support. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tu, for uh, highlighting and dwelling upon two very basic concepts. One is the concept of uh, nirvana, and other is the concept of uh, chitta or consciousness. Both are cornerstones of a uh, Buddhist uh, mode of thinking and way of uh, living. He rightly pointed out that uh, as a uh, a Buddhist text, Dhammapad says, Nirvanam Paramam Sukham. Nirvana is a supreme happiness. It is not just to be understood negatively as absence of uh, suffering, but also a feeling of enlightenment. And that feeling of enlightenment uh, is something which is a soothing experience. And therefore, uh, we have uh, a particular text uh, called Sukhavati Viewer, wherein we have description of uh, such a state of uh, 
existence in the state of uh, nirvana. Uh, so far as chitta is concerned, Buddhism greatly emphasizes purification of the self, purification of uh, chitta. In Vishuddhi Magha, we have uh, a course prescribed uh, for uh, self-purification, which is, uh, which is cultivation of uh, Kushala Chitta. And if there is Kushala Chitta, as I said earlier, there will always be Kushala Charya. So we thank you for uh, dwelling upon these two points. Now I invite uh, His Excellency, the Minister from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is a country which is a repository of uh, Theravada tradition. And uh, Theravada tradition is the foundation of uh, Buddhism because, to my mind, Mayan tradition is only a development out of uh, Theravada tradition. Theravada tradition provides the requisite foundation for that. So, Honorable Ganeshan Ji, please. Chairman uh, Professor Saad Bahat and uh, Harinda Prasad uh, Swamiji and uh, Dr. Taj Nath to forgive me, Venerable, if I am pronouncing your name wrongly. And uh, General Secretary of the BJP, Edgar Pirad of uh, Sri Lanka, Sri Ram Madhavji, and uh, recognized excellencies, scholars for various countries, myself and my colleague, Honorable Gamar Jayakram Pereira from Sri Lanka. Cabinet of Parliament of Sri Lanka, Cabinet of Sri Lanka. Thankful to all of you for inviting us. Thank you very much, India Foundation. Thanks, Nalanda. Thanks, Bihar. Thanks, Rajkir. Thanks, our official host, uh, Ram Madhuchi. As we are running out of time, I thought I should not stick very much to my script, but I should speak uh, straight. I was, uh, I, I was thinking about this uh, concept, Dharma Dhamma. I'm very much impressed by this concept, I should say. And also, the theme is Sat Sit Ananda, a leave of the Nirvana judgment. Away. <laughs> so, Sachi Sananda. I was listening to Ram Madhavchi. He said, he said, correct me if I'm wrong, he said, nations are mostly at, at peace only if they run out of all the alternatives. Oh, exhausted all the alternatives. Did he say that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I think now. Most of us, most of the nations as well, yeah, they do respect to all the nations and governments. We have problems with the peace. Therefore, we are not run out of all our alternatives. We are still left with many. I think we are analyzing, discussing the most suitable alternatives here, I believe so. See, back on Sri Lanka, where myself and Gamini Jayakram Perra, here representing. I am minister in charge of the Hindu religious affairs with many other national integration, social progress, the long list and the official languages. And he is also minister for Buddhasasana as well as Bayamba. Bayamba is, is region, Bayamba development. So this Sat Sit Ananda theme is very much relevant to, to Sri Lanka, I believe so, Mr. Chairman. Because uh, again, I go to 
Ramadavji, he said that since though he is a politician, he is going to, not going to speak politics here. I am also a politician. I can also say that. But when I was listening to him, I was listening to him between lines. He spoke politics, you would say. Therefore, you can listen to me between lines. I'll be speaking politics. In the list of penalists listed here, you see, they have listed very cleverly that two scholar priests or monks, I should say, and two politicians here. <laughs> yes. Sri Lanka, as you all know, as you be honest, and they can hide facts also. We had a very cruel war in this country for the last 30 years. Now, this is peace era. We opened up the peace era. Our government has very much opened up the peace era. And now, we are speaking the truth to each other. The Sat, speaking the truth, truth to each other. We are analyzing where we made mistakes. Looking back and looking at where we made mistakes. Learning from the mistakes, past mistakes. Therefore, we need to speak the truth to each other. The single speaking people, mostly the Buddhist, the Tamil speaking people, mostly Hindus, are speaking to each other. Listening to each other. Recognizing each other. Slowly we are moving forward. So we are speaking. The Sat is there. That's very important. Very relevant to us. The Sit with the mind. The Sri Lanka psyche is developing now. Sri Lanka psyche is changing now. The Sinhalese community, the Buddhist Sinhalese community, had lots of questions, worries, suspicions against the Hindu Tamil community in Sri Lanka. Vice versa, the Tamil Hindu community also had lot of questions, lots of suspicions, lot of lots of issues. The Sinhalese speaking community. So therefore, the minds of the Singhala, the minds of the Tamil, the Singhala psyche or Tamil psyche have been very much marred and colored due to the past experience of war and conflict and issues. Therefore, when we started speaking the truth in this peace era, slowly, steadily, our minds are changing. The psyche is changing. Sri Lankan psyche is changing. I'm glad about it. With all the responsibility, I announce at this assembly that Sri Lanka is progressing. Sri Lanka is moving forward. The change of mind, change of psyche, since we are speaking, that, speaking truth to each other. We are recognizing each other's fault. We are recognizing each other's identity. Sri Lanka is necessarily a multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic, Multi-religious country, like India, a multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic country. It's no hiding fact. Within which the single speakers are the numerical majority, the Buddhist are the numerical majority. Now this dharma dhamma concept, as I have, I have been impressed by that concept. I should say, I. I told my colleague, Honorable Gamini Jayakran Perra yesterday, this has given us, this, mess, this has given us more strength, so we should take a message back home that Dharma represents Hindus, Hinduism, Dhamma represents Buddhism. In Sri Lanka back home, if Hindus and Buddhists come closer to each other, then what is how they are now? But the Sinhalese and Tamils come, come to each other closer than how they are, how where they are now. It helps us the real-time unity in Sri Lanka. That is what we need. That is what we anticipate. That is a message, Mr. Chairman. I am as a minister, along with my colleague, taking back home the message. Thank you. Because When you put Buddhists and Hindus in Sri Lanka together, we are over 80 percent of the population. When you put the Sinhalese and the Tamils together in Sri Lanka, 
we are we are near 90% of the population sri lanka not the unity of the buddhist and hindus are not against the other sri lankan colleagues citizens who are following the religions of islam and christianity it is not against them but let us start bringing together the most relevant uh, religions relevant to each other there is dharma and dhamma start by that that will pave way for bringing others also in line they will join the bandwagon soon so sri lanka i think i should say uh, is a country uh, is uh, through the history of sri lanka as i said in the initial uh, segment of my presentation that we fail to understand accept recognize the similarities between hinduism and buddhism there are large number of similarities between hinduism and religion it was expressed more and more again here this stage but we miserably instead of concentrating on ourselves on the similarities we lost our heads in the differences come back to sri, come to sri lanka you have been most of you have been sri lanka if not please come to sri lanka see go to any buddhist vr buddhist temple you will see a buddhist temple also located within the buddhist temple they call devalaya there we are lord vishnu lord ganesh lord muruga are all respected and worshiped by the single buddhist and on the, on the other hand if you go to a temple you see lord buddha there lord buddha be be worshiped at the into temples back home at my home i am a hindu back home in my puja room i have lord buddha along with lord vishnu lord ganesh the name i obtained from <laughs> and the lord murga my family has three members including me myself and my son first we go to lord buddha worship him and then go to lord vishnu lord shiva wife goes to lord shiva then come to lord buddha <laughs> maybe uh, yet the point i will like to insist here is in the notice is that we have been living together we have been recognizing each other for centuries and centuries over 3000 years in sri lanka sri lanka has five ishwarams of worshiping lord shiva that is nagleshwaram in the north kedeshwaram in the northwest koneshwaram in the east munneshwaram in the west tandeshwaram in the south the five ishwarams ishwarams of lord shiva you know the point that these all these ishwarams are located in the coastal areas of sri lanka the north south east and west so the hinduism is and not a new um, religion or new entry into sri lanka it has been there for traditionally and now buddhism now as i said the buddhism and hinduism which which coming together it has already started myself and my minister dr jayakran perra who is charge of the buddha sasana very much committed to bring uh, take the message from this assembly back home sri lanka so that that will help us to bring our people together more and more and the past in which we try to um bring out the differences we live a past always and in the new era which i said as a peace era has already began commenced in sri lanka this message of this assembly that is dharma dhamma and also sat sit ananda again i living out the nirvana and would also strengthen the sri lankan journey i believe so thank you very much namaskar ai bhavan vanakkam good evening to you thank you
thank you his excellency for pointing out basic affinity between hinduism and uh, buddhism in fact uh, buddhism as advocated by lord buddha was not uh, in contravention with the basic uh, vedic uh, ideals lord buddha was uh, taught by his royal parents all scriptures available at his time what he rejected were the deviations in the society of that particular time which were not in accordance with the basic uh, nature of reality and uh, human being so there is therefore uh, no fundamental difference between S S buddhism and uh, hinduism well we have two concepts of otherness there is otherness between this object and that object but there is otherness also between this uh, hand and that hand this is separable otherness and this one is the inseparable otherness so there is otherness there is difference we don't deny the differences between hinduism and buddhism between uh, arnatmavad and uh, atmavad theories to use technical terms but basic uh, fundamental unity is there and that unity needs to be emphasized if that is done then definitely we shall be putting the two traditions in their right perspectives i am reminded of my personal experience in 1985 i was sent by government of india to china as a member of the first cultural delegation and there in china people used to ask me scholars are you a buddhist and my answer was i am a hindu buddhist which means that uh, there is no difference between hinduism and buddhism for me i worship lord buddha in my home i have studied buddhist literature along with the vedic literature and uh, i don't find a fundamental difference except some doctrinal differences of course there are doctrinal differences within hinduism there are doctrinal differences within buddhism you have within buddhism you have a uh, theravada tradition you have mahayana tradition you have mantrayana tradition and so many other traditions are there so differences are there and differences provide richness they need not be bulldozed and therefore there are differences between hindu view of life and the buddhist view of life we should appreciate that but doesn't mean that uh, the two are contradictory that two can go together and there can be a happy symbiosis of the two anyway i don't want to prolong uh, my comments uh, in fact uh, we are very happy sir to know that uh, you are striving to bring about uh, their sort of unity between the two traditions and uh, also that uh, uh, in sri lanka there is a now progressive development and we uh, people of india wish uh, the best uh, for uh, sri lanka Uh, for uh, peace and prosperity there the government of india is always in favor of uh, peace and prosperity not only within the country but all over the world we never say god bless india or <laughs> god bless uh, my uh, country we always say god bless the whole universe sarve bhavantu sukhina well that is the ideal which uh, we have put forth uh, and uh, we should strive for that uh, uh, we had the uh, friends very stimulating as also enlightening deliberations on uh, the theme of uh, satchit and ananda and in fact uh, this ananda is nothing but uh, nirvana only to my mind and therefore uh, satchit and ananda Uh, uh, would be in fact repetitive no difference between satchit and 
आनंद और निर्वाण सो फार एज दिस टू टर्म्स धर्म एंड धर्म आर कंसर्न दे ऑफकोर्स रिप्रजेंट टू डिफरेंट रिलीजियस ट्रेडिशंस बट वेन वी कंसिव ऑरिजिनली because i was associated with the first uh, dharma dharma conference uh, and all subsequent ones it was more linguistic dharma is sanskrit and dhamma is a uh, pali so that was our idea initially but later on of course uh, denominations uh, crept crept in and uh, we got associated uh, dharma with hindu tradition and uh, dharma with the, the buddhist tradition anyway i thank uh, the distinguished uh, learned uh, panelist for uh, giving us uh, food of for thought uh, and uh, i hope that uh, the deliberations uh, in the coming uh, two days would uh, further draw upon the discourses that they have presented thank you very much thank you all thank you professor sr bhat for chairing this uh, wonderful session uh, may i request you to felicitate uh, our distinguished speakers i request you to felicitate uh, honorable minister shri manoj ganeshan I request you to felicitate uh, Sri Hari Prasad Swami Ji. May I request you to uh, felicitate Venerable Professor Dr. Tejna Tu. thank you sir please facilitate ram madhav ji thank you sorry sir sir uh, may i felicitate uh, sorry so may i was like i uh, ask request lalita Swa kumar mangalam to felicitate sir but take a 15 minutes tea break and then uh, next plenary session will start at 16:30 